Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Visiting Arts, thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely to see so many people here this morning. So I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Visiting Arts, Greater Stretton, and the Africa, Caribbean Cultures Trust Programme. We're delighted to have you all here. And this year it's slightly different. I want to explain. We have 10 artists here from the Africa, Caribbean Pacific Programme. And actually the director of the programme from the EU as well is here. And this programme has <coughs> been a journey of both young creative artists or emerging creative artists from Ethiopia, Malawi, Trinidad and Tobago, Solomon Islands, Fiji, Tonga. And they've been on a three-year programme with us and each other, um, networking across the world, um, extending their reach of their art practice and also of their entrepreneurship. And this is the final event where we brought them to Edinburgh to meet you and a lot of other people to extend their contacts and reach. It's been a really valuable program and I encourage you to speak to these people afterwards when we have time for more networking. I won't introduce them all now, but you can come up, we will stay here afterwards and you can come up and meet them. The theme of this morning is what are festivals for? There are a lot of emerging festivals in, in new countries and there are a lot of established festivals and we're delighted to have the two directors of the most established festivals at least in the western world. That's the Edinburgh International Festival and the Holland Festival and we're going to ask them to say a few words in a moment. We're going to show a very short video of our work to date and then there'll be a kind of conversation between the delegates here, the two speakers, and of course you. So if you put your hand up, I'll come with the mic, and we've got a mic at the back as well. So I'll just show our video to see the kind of work we've been doing. Thank you. you to look at that. This is being live streamed on that platform, so it's a very useful platform. So now, to our speakers. First of all, Fergus Linehan, director of the Edinburgh International Festival, well known to you all, I'm sure. He came from the Sydney Festival, where he did a fantastic job of changing a little bit of the culture there, um, and also from the Dublin Theatre Festival before that. So, Fergus, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to stand up, because you can't see at the back. 
And um, first of all, just to everyone, welcome to Edinburgh. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here. Um, we must do this event about lunchtime next year, though. We <laughs> <laughs> collectively agree this. <laughs> So if I'm a little slow, and um, you'll, you'll, you'll excuse me. Look, I just, um, just to, I mean, I always make the assumption everyone knows what, what our festivals are, but I do want to break it down a little bit, because obviously different people have come for the first time, or, or have been here because the Edinburgh International Festival is, is part of a suite of festivals here in Edinburgh in August, which, um, I mean, just to mention a few, there's ourselves, the Fringe Festival, the tattoo, the military tattoo at the castle, the book festival, and the art festival. Um, and that is part of a larger suite of festivals that takes place in Edinburgh throughout the year. Um, so um, actually the pictures here tell the story of our festival quite nicely because these are the productions we have in this theater. Um, this is uh, Cosy Fan Flute, which is a co-production of Festival d'Aix-en-Provence, um, which opens tonight. Um, so this is... Uh, Scottish Ballet here, who did a piece by uh, Angeline Pellocage and the Canadian choreographer Crystal Pike. And somewhere around the other corner is a picture of Cecilia Bartoli, which was a production of, of Bellini's Norma with the Salzburg Festival. So in their way, they sort of tell the story of a, a Scottish festival and a French festival coming together with a German orchestra to do um, you know, a, a work by an Austrian. So, or, or a Canadian and a French choreographer working with the Scottish Ballet Company. And so, so essentially we are kind of international at our core and the whole foundation of this festival was very much around internationalism and the idea of internationalism. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, again, just, just a, a big welcome. I won't preempt too much about what we're gonna talk about, but I'm, I'm really interested to hear um, why this group is interested in Festivals and international collaboration because I think there's, a, there's an interesting about that. Is that me? <laughs> okay, I'll answer that again. So anyway, um, I will hand over to Ruth McKenzie to say a few words. Ruth, let me introduce Ruth. Oh, um, sorry, I'm just right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, Ruth is the director, artistic director of the Holland Festival. Uh, before that, she was the director of the Cultural Olympiad for London 2012. Before that, uh, festivals such as Manchester International Festival, Chichester Festival, Vienna Festival, and of course, Scottish Opera. And she's also been, um, uh, what's I the words? She's worked for five secretaries of state uh, for culture. So that gives her a fantastic background. So over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. And thank you also for, for your great welcome. Um, uh, it's great to be here and have the chance to start, uh, as we always do, especially in the middle of the night, reflecting on why, why you have a festival and what it should be doing. Um, uh, uh, it's particularly good today, actually, in Edinburgh, when not only are all uh, the artists and producers uh, and festival makers in town, but also um, culture ministers from all over the world. So that's a very interesting kind of clash of culture, if you like, from those that do, that's all of you guys, to those that are meant to empower us to do. Um, so it's a particularly good time, I think, for us to be talking about what we're all here for and how we can all do a better job. Um, and that, that, I think, within the, you know, within the boundaries of live streaming, so remember, every indiscreet and honest you make is going around the whole world. Um, it's, it's a really good chance for us to try and see how we can do a better job to create the conditions for artists and, of course, for audiences, which is our other great um, uh, starting point. And maybe I should just say that the Holland Festival um, was set up the same year as the Edinburgh International Festival. Um, we were both created in 1947, so uh, both these festivals are now pretty old, the same year as Avignon as well. In, as Fergus suggested, in the spirit after the war, uh, when these cities of Edinburgh and Amsterdam and Avignon were all um, undergoing great hardship, you know, they, they had you know, enormous damage to their infrastructure, they'd, they'd been suffering terribly for years during the Second World War, they didn't have food, they didn't have 
uh, schools, hospitals, everything. They had nothing. But they all turned to international performing artists and invested in international performing artists to help them build the future. And I think you know, that, for me, is, is an awesome responsibility that, that we inherit, um, that in 1947, a festival was that important to the everyday lives of people in Edinburgh and Amsterdam and Avignon that they were prepared to sacrifice in order to create those festivals. So the Holland Festival happens every year, like the Edinburgh International Festival, we happen in Amsterdam. Like the Edinburgh International Festival, we look for the greatest artists from around the world, and we try to find that same urgency, that same reason why international artists can help us understand the future. So that's my starting point. <laughs> So perhaps a good start, a second starting point in, is to open up that conversation a bit to why now and what is it for now? Has it changed? Um, uh, you know, I think um, just before we start, is this, is this working? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want, we were talking earlier just about, about an article I read recently just, just asking three questions of a festival. One was what it is, in other words, what is the actual show? Is it any good? Is the performance good? Um, the other is where it is the actual location, which I think is, is really critical. But then the third is the why. And we were just saying earlier on, we're very lucky because we had such a strong why. And certainly with, with Edinburgh, I, I would say, nobody really sat down and said, you know, what we really need is to celebrate art. That was not the foundation of it. What they said was, we really need to find a, a way of celebrating which is not based on nationalism, which is secular. Um, and which will will celebrate all that we shared, because the actual idea of a multi-genre arts festival we can't find one before forty-seven. So there's things like Salzburg, which was about Wagner, and there's things like the Venice Biennale and um, Cannes Film Festival. But that idea of saying no, this is not about one thing. It's not about Scottish work or it's not about opera. It's it's about the actual spirit of international harmony, um, and I think that still absolutely informs it. Um, and, and it's, I think, a credit to Edinburgh and, and the, the, the quality of governance that that's completely understood and, and those pressures that some would say, you know, are put to bear on others about, you know, well, you should be doing this or you should be doing that. The, the, the bottom line is, is that it has to be a moment where international kind of harmony is, is, is the focus. And that's not always easy. <laughs> but I think I, so I would say with, with ourselves, I think, and, and particularly at the moment, um, I would say that the, the, the founding principles of it are, are as they were. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, and I think that one of, the, um, one of the big responsibilities I feel about the festival is um, that the founding principles, which is your artist-led, but your artist-led, that means you're inviting artists but respecting their ideas. So, you know, I would never dream of saying to an artist, please could you make a show, you know, about, about this topic and can it be this long and have this number of people? That isn't the job of a festival, I think, uh, like ours. It's a, our job is to say, your work is fantastic to an artist. You know, we're really interested in seeing how we can work with you and how you could come to our festival and we can, you know, sh showcase your thinking. But of course, that is in the context of our audience, and that is incredibly important, because it's also our job to think about the journey that our existing audiences have been on. And we both share audiences of enormous loyalty who behave as, you know, as the, as the chair, chair people of a fan club who are expert about our festivals. Both of us are, interestingly, this is, our second festival this year. We both started at the same time. Um, and I'm sure you agree, you know, you spend a lot of your time talking to audiences who have been coming to the festival, if not quite since 1947, but certainly for decades, and who really keep the hold the flame um, in the most brilliant way. And we have to respect that history and the way that our audience are the keepers of that history. Um, but also, of course, we have to find new audiences 
and reflect the reality today. And in Amsterdam, one of, I think, the most fascinating things for me um, has been to begin working with local partners who might be third generation Turkish immigrants or who might be second generation Moroccan immigrants or who might just have arrived in, in town from Syria um, and to be finding art that uh, is world class, that, that shows the best of their cultural and contemporary traditions, but that can surprise and amaze the traditional audiences of the Holland Festival as well as engage a new audience. And that is one of, I think, the, the most interesting um, ways for me uh, to begin to renew that urgency that Amsterdam felt in 1947. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's, it's always interesting. I don't know with, with youth, but just, just there's also the question of, of the challenge of the multi-genre. <laughs> <laughs> which I find, you know, because once you say you're international and you say you're multi-genre, well, then people say, well, what are you doing about this and this and this? And, and I think that's, that's always finding that balance of, of the capacity for a festival to be able to develop or whether it can really reflect. Because you always, you're always there and you realize, on the one hand, you've managed to sort of subvert everyone's normal, the way they normally attend. So you've got a kind of an openness that no one else has. Um, but then on the other hand, you've only got a window of three weeks. And, and I think that that's, that's always an interesting challenge. So, so can you, to what degree can you sort of change the ecosystem, the cultural ecosystem within with your work, within which you're working? And to what degree are you essentially having to reflect, you know? You're absolutely right, and I actually find the idea of genres, you know, music, dance, drama, opera, really um, restrictive at times. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, um, I mean, I noticed we, we now, this is a really technical point, forgive me, but it's, it's fundamental to the daily life of a festival director. Uh, we have changed the way we organize our program in, in the book we have for the program, which used to be in genres, music, theatre, dance, now it's in days, chronology. So it's, mm. it tells you what's on on the first day, then what's on on the second day. Uh, but, be, but again, for our traditional audiences, we still had to have somewhere online, you have to be able to look up in a, what everything that is an opera or everything that is a play. Um, I was very pleased to find we had one piece in the 2016 festival that appeared under every single genre. <laughs> uh, because the truth is that if you are artist-led, artists don't really think in terms of genre. <laughs> they just think about the, the, what they want to say and the tools that they will use. And also, it has to be said, genre, uh, it, the idea of dance, drama, music being separate is a very um, limited Western European cultural tradition and not a tradition that exists in other parts of the world. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you guys would like to jump in at that point. Yeah, for me, I was... Uh... No, no. Uh, yeah, I was caught up. Uh, I was only for, because we were busy doing uh, workshops. Uh, uh, my name is Tesfaye Wildemitin from Ethiopia, uh, storyteller. And uh, what I was, I'm trying to say is uh, I w my plan was just to focus on the storytelling because there's not much time. And uh, I was really caught up by amazing dance performances, amazing uh, comedy shows, uh, and all those things that you see. And uh, you get uh, leaflets and uh, this seems interesting. And you just go there and then, oh, this is great. And then you go to the other one. And all of them, you find them you find some link that relates to what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't say, I'm a storyteller, I just need a s just stories. You need humor in your stories. You need to be musical in your uh, storytelling. You need to be an actor. Uh, and uh, this uh, really uh, was the case for me. One of the things I'm interested in terms of this group is, you know, people who in terms of touring and in terms of becoming part of international festivals and that international conversation, why it's so much more important for some countries and less important for others. So, I mean, you, when you think of it, I mean, places like Quebec or places like Flanders 
and places where they have you know, a lot of questions around cultural identity. But, but there's a business logic, obviously, in relation to representing, you know, perhaps broadening the market for your work. But I think in terms of practice for artists, um, it's an enormous investment of, of time and energy and money to go overseas. Mm -hmm. um, and for some artists, it's a crucial part of their practice. But we all know some artists just should stay at home and within a very, and, and form something within that. So I'm interested as to, you know, even outside of just, just the, the business side of, of, of touring and being part of festivals, for, for the artist, what that experience is and, and why it's important. <laughs> I'll ask Ebony and, and Rochelle to, to respond because I think it's very pertinent to their work. Ebony Fifita from uh, Tonga, which is in the South Pacific. We are um, the biggest region, I think, the bluest region in the world. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to come to that, but first just comment on what you were both talking about um, in terms of genre and just give a little bit of um, a perspective from from my region and from, um, from my experience. Um, it's absolutely true how, what you're saying about how the um, divisions, I guess, or fragmentation of our work as artists almost um, uh, yeah, confuses it. Uh, in the Pacific, what I understand from the generation of my grandmother, um, grandparents, is that the artists were, see that word even, for us, if I say artist back home, people will think, oh, you're a painter. So there isn't even that wide um, yeah, understanding of, of that word. But from the generation of my grandparents, those cultural guardians, I think, um, were singers, no doubt, were dancers, were healers, were um, the people who nurtured the land. And in that, in everything that that encompassed, you know, nurtured the community, navigated um, the, the present understood the past um, and there's so much woven into that um, that that's where our work in the Pacific is trying to re um, rekindle I guess in in our artists that same sense of responsibility and, um, and and connection and not try to box them into saying well are you a choreographer or a writer um, because that that has so many limitations to it um, and then what were we, what were we I'll just, just, just ask you the question in relation to, um, to, to as, as, a, as an artist, say, why coming, I, coming, I, why, why, yeah. why do you why need to have this? Why international? Why not? <laughs> um, so my country, tiny, tiny, doesn't show up on a normal size map. Um, I'm here with colleagues from Fiji and the Solomons. Um, you're lucky if you can see them on a map as well, we know that we exist, but the rest of the world doesn't. And if they do, they have a very generalized idea of, of, of our reality. Um, we're not walking around in coconut bras. We <laughs> are not happy all the time. Uh, we don't think that we live in paradise. Um, we, we want to leave um, <laughs> all the time, <laughs> and we can't. <laughs> but really, that's, that's, that's what um, my, me, my peers express, is just such a longing to not be where they are, to, to move. Um, and while that's exciting, it's also really, really, um, but let me let me just jump in here to, to think about those ministers that are sitting in a room somewhere else. Mm. In the Pacific? The cult, I don't know. I don't we find so. out. <laughs> but the, but it but even if they're not, we from the Pacific, we can think about how to how to oh, all right, I have a microphone. How to get a message back to mm. those politicians that, that have power um, over your lives. Because it, what you're talking about actually is a, um, it, there's a policy term that in, here in the UK is, has become very fashionable, which is about placemaking. Mm. And it's about the way in which artists um, have the voice, have the power 
to tell the story of the place where they live and work and to, to if you like, amplify, to, to be a way of expressing the concerns of, of the citizens and of their audiences, of their <coughs> public back home. And in a, in a way, when, when Fergus was talking about Quebec, which again is a tiny little place in the middle of nowhere in Canada, which is... <laughs> Watch it, we're streaming. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love Quebec. Um, um, what is interesting about it is that for decades, the powers, the political powers in Quebec went, right, we are going to give our artists mm. money and opportunities to tell our stories, mm. exactly to tell about the complexity of our stories. So it isn't just the, the, you know, the, the stereotype of Quebec, or indeed, for those that don't know anything about Quebec, it, it doesn't exist on the map. Mm. And for decades, Quebec gave money to artists, and as a result, there are artists from Quebec who have taken the message of Quebec around the world, who represent Quebec around the world. I mean, the Edinburgh International Festival, you know, has, has, has invited artists from Quebec. And I think you have to relate that investment and that mm -hmm. policy to the result that those artists then have that opportunity. But, of course, as folks were saying, there are some artists where the placemaking process, where what they want to say about their, their own people, their own lives, their own place, actually is only for their own family and their own people. Um, you know, and, and I think it's really important, that point, that, that because, it, of course, it's a, sort of, it's a different sort of oppression, actually, if it's only possible to be an artist and get funding in, in a, if you are prepared to be an ambassador for your country. And that is something that, that we, as people who believe in artistic freedom, need to be aware of. And it's something that we find, don't we, as festival directors, that you know, we, we are not here to be, we are here to represent artists, to support artists to be free to say what they want to say. And sometimes if they are you know, supported by their, by their political powers to be the ambassadors of Quebec, that is a dangerous thing. So it's okay in Quebec because the values of Quebec are for artistic freedom. But it's a complicated um, opportunity and threat, I think, the, the political fashion for placemaking. Makatha uh, Matukuta from Malawi. I am a theater practitioner, also a festival organizer, a young festival organizer, <laughs> because my festival is just uh, one year old. Uh, I want just to contribute what uh, she has said and he, he has said. Uh, why international coming to this side? It has got also like uh, freedom in terms of uh, financial aspect or economic <coughs> aspect. <coughs> like uh, in most of African countries, arts is not funded, including my country. Like in my country, there is no culture policy, there is no arts council. The only funding which is there, it has just been introduced three months ago. It's known as Malawi Cultural Fund. And that Malawi Cultural Fund is limited. They are targeting much the theater companies. People like George, my friend who is in music, he has got nowhere to get money. So the moment we travel like this side, we have got a lot of things which we benefit uh, financially because here arts, I cannot say it's well funded, but at least there is something which comes into arts. The other thing is a, a sharing experience. Like a, for us in Malawi, we don't have like an institution where you can go and learn arts. Yes, we have got the Chancellor, others they have been at the University of Malawi, the Chancellor College. It's a, 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 the Department of Fine and Performing Arts. But out of uh, 120,000 students who start for all levels, it's only 40 people who are selected to study at that university. And it has got some criteria. If you don't have uh, six credits, you cannot go to the university. Like in my case, I've got five credits, I did manage to have uh, six credits, but I cannot go to that university. 
So when we come here, we also gain knowledge how we can operate in our countries and impart that knowledge to uh, other countries. Like for my example, I've done a theater. This is my 17th year in, in, in theater. I have done a lot than those students who have gone under the University of Malawi. So if I go there and I apply, I want to study this, they say go and write the O levels, you have six credits, which, is, which doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I, I applied for the university, I think one in Netherlands, one in Switzerland, just using my CV. They said the work you have done, you are qualified to do masters. But in my country, they are saying you have to do uh, undergraduate. So th these are some of the things which, uh, like w when we travel, it's been, and the, the festivals, uh, they have got a great impact in e economic uh, uh, aspects. Because if uh, I invite one of the artists from uh, any country when he travels to that country, automatically is bringing the folex to the country and it's contributing to the national uh, GDP whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, for example, others they have attended the Lake of Stars. Lake of Stars is one of the first ones which is well patronized from all over the world. I mean, the government make a lot of money from Lake of Stars but they don't support art. So when we're having like this network, it also makes artists to be freely economically independent. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I was going to suggest that a, a number of those points, Ruth's point about um, relating it back to the policy makers is, is very important. But clearly, traveling to see festivals is an incredible opportunity to reflect on your own practice and your own country's practice. I wonder if I, I'd like to open it up to the floor here as well. But one of the questions Ruth touched on that I'd like to talk a little bit more about or ask the festival directors to talk about was you said about the artists coming with an idea. So you said earlier on that what festivals don't do really is show products, but that it's a result of a relationship. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that as a very interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, it can be, it, it can just be an idea. I mean, one of the things I think that people often, one of the mistakes people make is they come with a project and they go, here's the fully formed project, will you bring this to your festival? Whereas in fact, what often happens is you go, well, I liked that performance or I love the writing in it. Um, and what happens two years later, we had Javier Lopage, who was here last year, went along to a show and just loved the design of it and actually picked up the designer to work on a piece in the Met in four years' time. So, so that, that's what you don't see, and I think that that is, that is the conversations that open up. So, I mean, this is just sort of advice from our seat, is, is if you come to these discussions with a specific project and that project doesn't go on, it's very tangential the way the way those conversations happen, um, and and often the most delicate of conversations are the genesis for a big involvement later on. It's not kind of as, as linear as people might think. It, I, I think this is always the hardest and most frustrating message in these sort of networking events because. Um, I, I started off in, in small-scale touring theater, and of course, all, all I did was, was have, my, have my packages to try and get festival directors to buy. That was all I did. Um, uh, but, but Fergus is right. It's, it, it's not about shopping. You know? It's not that we take a, a supermarket trolley and we go to the warehouse where you can buy shows for festivals and go up and down and say, well, we have one of those and one of those. That isn't how it works. It is about a, a conversation and a process um, and the development of, of partnerships and of ideas. And, and sometimes it can take you know, years, and sometimes it can happen really quickly. Um, and that is the most frustrating thing to say, because I know that when, when, you're, when, you, know, when you are when I, when I was representing a theatre company, you know, I'm happy to talk about anything. I mean, I'd say anything to anybody, but all I really wanted them to do was buy my show. <laughs> uh, and it was really hard to understand why they wouldn't buy my show, because of course I thought my show was the best show in the world. 
Um, uh, and it took me a few years to realize that it wasn't, actually. <laughs> um, but so it, it, it is a hard, it's a hard message, but, but the truth is that if you are a curator, and of course, all the curators know this, you know, that is a skill. It is, it is, you know, it isn't being a shopper. It's like, it's like being a cook. You know, you're trying to put together a banquet. You're trying, you're looking for lots and lots of different sorts of balances and flavors. It's not about, you know, just is this, is this fish a good fish and a fresh fish? It's about, well, how many fish have I already got in my banquet? Um, uh, it, it, so it is a process of, of dialogue and, you know, and, and debate to come up with a way to make the best banquet. I think it's, it's ideas as well. You know, I mean, really struck what you're saying about migration, because, you know, I grew up in Ireland in the 80s and everybody left. Everybody left. Yeah. It was just, and that sense of thing. And, and one of the things that's really emerging this August is this question of, of migration and, and, and a really interesting thought, because, of course, artists are coming at it from the, the different point of view, which is not about how do we deal with this issue, it's why do people leave? And also, people have always left, why do we wander, you know? Why, do, what, you know, this English person in, in, in Holland and an Irish person in Scotland, and you know, why, what, what is it that, that, that makes us move? Of course, circumstance makes us move sometimes, but it's much more than that. And I think sometimes it's the kernel of an idea like that which becomes the start of of, of the programming process. Um, and I, I mean, so, so I think when we, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning is what's the why of a festival? Um, and what's, what's the point of it? And then trying to understand that in the conversation. You know, Rochelle, there are a lot of festivals in Trinidad. Have you got a Hi, everyone. I'm Rochelle Amor. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm a writer and I co host and co produce a podcast back home called TNT Unpacked. I have so much catching up to do on this conversation, um, but uh, the most recent um, dialogue that you guys are having as festival directors about you know, curating and uh, uh, buying shows is a dialogue that happens at a level that doesn't even apply to Trinidad and Tobago because of how our festivals are set up. The biggest one that I'm sure everyone knows about is Carnival. TNT Carnival is, you know, I guess after hearing you speak, it is definitely a multi-genre uh, festival in itself. Um, and it is mostly run by the government. So it's not necessarily, we don't necessarily have festival directors. We have a, a carnival board. So the organization is very, very different. Um, and that makes it a bit more difficult for artists working within that festival to use the platform for uh, various expressions. So for example, we have our traditional carnival characters, we have modern expressions, we have um, limbo festivals, we have Carnival King and Queen, um, which is a uh, design, costume design, and that's huge. It's, it, there's a prize, there's a comp it's a competition. So there's prize, there's a steel pan, um, there's the soca, and that that's so all of these things happen at the same time so it's kind of like an industry more than a festival <laughs> and you know um when you asked about the urgency why do we need to go abroad we had a an, an australian soca dj who was actually dutch on the podcast a, a few months ago and he said you know tnt invented soca music it's the home of soca music but there is soca music happening in Germany, that's in German being sung. There's soca music happening all around the world. We don't know about it, we don't play it, we don't invite those artists over, we don't mm. engage. Mm. We're not part of that international conversation. So our culture's running away from us in that sense. And the exact same thing happened with the steel band. And we are having to catch up after it because you know we don't go out there, we don't tour. We don't, you know, and it's amazing because um, a friend of mine who lives in London recently went to uh, the Berlin Carnival and then we're going to Notting Hill Carnival next week and there's this carnival and there's that carnival. <laughs> where, where are our traditional, why isn't Damien Whiskey, who's a traditional midnight robber, touring to present? Mm. So I said to Mark, mm. my friend um, at Notting Hill, who's a DJ there as well, I said, why, why, doesn't, why don't you uh, get Damien to perform at that, and he goes, we've never, mm. this band had an, an international, um, traditional character come and perform 
You got the, the musicians who come on their own, they pay their own way, they got paid, so it's a gig more than anything else. You have the carnival band promoters, um, who again, it's, it's private and they, they do their own thing and they make a lot of money <laughs> um, in these international festivals, but the actual people from the country where this carnival started are not involved. So I think that's where the urgency lies for us. <laughs> um, what else did I have to, I wrote everything down because I forget everything all the time. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. I open it up to the floor and then you Show, still yeah. pitch it. Sorry. Pitch it. Yeah. I'm aware that time is running away with us. And I would just say, uh, if anybody was at our reception and saw Damien Whiskey as Midnight Robber, it's something that you would never forget. It was fantastic. Um, please do, now I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, we have other artists here who um, I hope will also be able to respond. But it's over to you. There's a microphone over there. And if not, well, we can carry on. Uh, yeah, George. Um, yeah, I just wanted to find out um, what room do you think there is on, on the international festival platform for art from um, Africa, the Pacific, and Caribbean, which doesn't tell a story of a struggle? <laughs> and also does which is which is a little bit more cosmopolitan and doesn't involve the traditional wear which no one when we're back home wears. Yeah. I mean you know, if it's any consolation, I think I think there's that that exists for everyone, you know, when you say can we do some ballet from Russia that isn't just tutus or you know, can we do an Irish play that isn't five men in a pub. It's, um, <laughs> and so, I mean, I think, I think there is, I mean, this, is, this has to be the, the best platform because yeah. we do not have to just feed into existing expectations in relation to it, yeah. So, I mean, I, I of, of course, I, I believe these festivals are, are the very best platform for that. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, pressure for artists in, in Africa to sort of present that kind of yeah um, there's a lot of pressure from for African artists to sort of fit into that um, category and 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 they feel as if that's the only way they can export their art yeah um, and I feel I feel like that's also fueled by the fact that those are the only artists that that actually mostly come yeah. to the international festivals yeah. um, it's no longer art for art's sake it's more um, parading sort of cultural differences yeah. I mean, I mean it, is, it is the same when, when a, you know, Scottish work goes somewhere else and people go, can we have the kilts and the bagpipes, yeah, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's, there's no doubt there's always, I think, that pressure to feed into cultural yeah. stereotypes. The question over there. Hi, hello, uh, my name is Pierre. Um, I work for Circus Centro, Newcastle and Edinburgh. Uh, my question is to Ruth. I'm also from Holland. I, my question is, um, it is a general perception that it's much easier to work in wealthy countries like Scandinavia, Switzerland, Holland. What are the challenges you find that perhaps we can uh, find a resemblance when you are from Toga, when you are from Vanuatu, when you are from those countries that are really striving? Is there anything that perhaps is similar? You know, um, I, I have to be honest here and say, uh, you're right that um, that in uh, in what I now I'm obliged to call mainland Europe, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a level of funding and um, understanding about the importance of culture and the contribution of culture um, that means that for uh, uh, many of us who work in in, in those cultural organisations. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we, we we are respected. We have a budget. You know, we have we have a level of resource and understanding that is an enormous privilege. I mean, it's, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the world, and I I cannot insult my colleagues by saying that there are significant disadvantages about that. There are not. I mean, it's what I've dreamed of my whole life, to be honest. You know, I was saying I was saying to colleagues in the room. Um, one of the feedbacks from my 2016 program uh, is that um, we, could, we should be more risky. We should take more risks. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you that have ever worked with me or seen my programs, you'll know that you know, nobody has ever, ever said to me I should take more risks because I'm generally regarded as, as being you know, at the extreme edge of risk. 
I take, I take a lot of risks. Um, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be in a culture where, where actually there's a, you know incentive to be riskier, mm. to go further. Um, and what I'm particularly proud of in, in Amsterdam, this is my, you know, thanks to the audience of Amsterdam, we, we, we broke the box office records for um, the program this year, which I, most people uh, um, in, in the UK would consider to be an insanely risky program. But it, it, the people of Amsterdam love risk. And I, thanks to decades of adventure from a Holland festival since 1947, I inherit um, an atmosphere where I have the artistic freedom, um, the hunger for artistic adventure, and the resource. So what I would say is, you know, everyone else in the world needs to follow this example and come up with the financial base plus the respect for artistic freedom. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't insult you by saying that there's something bad about having money and freedom. There's nothing bad about <laughs> money and freedom. Everyone should have it. Thank you very much. There's one question over here. I am aware of time, so if we could keep it short. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Andrew Wood, San Francisco International Arts Festival. And I'm going to pick up on something that Pierre just says and then try and hook it back into the part of the conversation. Um, speak up, I can't hear. Sorry, my name is Andrew Wood, San Francisco International Arts Festival, and I want to try and pick up what Pierre just said and try and put it back into another part of the conversation. He talked about what's common throughout the world, and there's one thing that's common to most places, and that's government policy. No matter where you live, there is a government that has a policy, and it includes the arts. Another part of the conversation today was about cultural placemaking, which is a government policy. Another name for cultural placemaking is gentrification, or Negro removal. And it is something that the arts are complicit in, and the artists don't always know which side of the fence they're supposed to stand on. But the problem is that artists are always or often used as the first steps in removing a population that exists in one place in order to put in a wealthier population. In the country that I live in, the United States, the cultural placemaking um, policies are driven by corporations and very large foundations that are created by wealthy persons and corporations. So when you follow the money and see where those intentions are coming from, when the output is that communities are removed because of gentrification or artist placemaking, you have to wonder where the artists stand in that. And are they deliberate carpetbaggers, or are they going to stand up and defend their own communities? So that's just a question that I think about. Thank you. Well, I, I have to say, I think that's quite a <laughs> cynical view and quite draconian. These things happen. Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily common uh, uh, artist experience and there are ways of mitigating it. But I'll, I'll hand it over to yes. Ruth. At the it is, and in Britain as well. Yeah, no, yeah. It, 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 it absolutely does happen and it, it is a, I think it is a, you know, it, it is actually um, uh, both governments at national level and at city level and of course property developers um, uh, do uh, use artists as a way to increase the, the value um, of a particular part of, of, you know, of their country or of their city. There's no doubt about that. But, but I also think, just, just, to, just to push back for a minute, I'm just going to, I'll finish in a second, then over to you, sorry. I also think that um, uh, it is important to respect the fact that there are artists from, from all parts of the world who do feel passionate about the need to communicate and share the concerns of the place where they live and uh, you know and who do do are happy to align with their own country I mean I, I lived and worked in Scotland at a time when Scotland got its own um, parliament and there was an enormous artistic energy which I don't believe was um, was was you know was was cynical or was about you know making house prices go up, but it was about wanting to express and explore and share what contemporary Scotland was about, and I think that is an important energy for artists, and it is the energy that says you know can we have can can we have artists that tell the stories that are our real stories, not just bad news stories, but are 
you know, about our, the reality of contemporary life and complexities. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a really important thing for those of us that are working in the arts, <coughs> to support those artists. I'd like to take two questions. There's a Sorry. question here, one other question, and then... Uh, no, I'm just a moment uh, two words. I feel that I have an incredible opportunity to be here. My name is Katie Dolidze. I'm from Tbilisi, Georgia, from the Georgian International Festival of Arts, artistic director. Here are people who created our incredible festival in 1997 mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the country where, uh, which was torn by war. We began it in 88. Rob Brookman is here. David Blank is, uh, was uh, the incredible man who passed away, unfortunately. Jan Skobi and these incredible people and William Bardekus created this incredible festival for us. I'm here presenting Georgian uh, one of the Georgian best theatres, I think, to Manishvili Film Actors Theatre, who presents uh, uh, Streetcar Named Desire and the Roxy Central, and we will be very happy to invite you all. But what I wanted to say, and what is very much uh, why I came here, because uh, the uh, international community of festivals, the friendship is very important, very important, because our festival, because of my opposition uh, activity in, nine, in 2009, was closed because I was in opposition. And God bless, everything is finished. We have a very good government in 2012. We are back to our country, I, I think so. And the festival is back. And at that time, the support of my international community, friends from the other festivals, were incredible. It was Rob Brookman, it was all others, it was William Bardetkutz who kept this festival alive. Even it came back after five years. And this is very important. Every country, from Africa till the Samoa Islands, we have to be one community. And we have to know our needs. Uh, how I came here and I finished. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not have money. And our Minister of Culture, which I think will go after elections in October, <laughs> he will do his festival. He uh, makes very good jazz festival, and this is on his, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I know. I think he, he told us we don't, yes, we don't have money. So we cut a little bit budget of the gift festival, and we came here to bring our production because our existence at the uh, wonderful Edinburgh Festival was more important. Mm. Thank you very much and welcome to Georgia. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that question of, of gentrification and money because I think it's a really important one. Um, I think, you know, and especially because, you know, in terms of, you know, from a position of privilege in terms of having all of these different stakeholders, but I do think one of the things that one is constantly managing is to put together this, you have to have a broad church of interests. And different people are involved and investing for very different reasons. So as you say, some people might be about gentrification of a neighborhood, another might be about tourism, another might be about health, and another, you know, so, so it comes, and increasingly in terms of government policy, um, it's coming from all of these different areas. And I think in the UK, we went through a process of having to justify ourselves through all of these byproducts of what we do, in a sense. Um, but in a sense, that comes back to us. And it's, the, it's stakeholder management and making sure the tail doesn't wag the dog. And so, I, I mean, of course you have to be careful if you're dealing with big corporations and investment, and you're dealing with governments that aren't interested in the art, but they're interested in other outcomes. That management is, is our job. And, and any of those stakeholders, I think, can, can take on an importance that is disproportionate. Um, but, but that does come back to us. But we still need stakeholders, and we still need sponsors, and we still need donors. And even if some of their motivations are completely different to ours, I think it comes back to us. And that question of stakeholder management at, through really great governance, I think, is something It's a little dull, but it's absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, 
I have to stop it now. Please, can you continue the conversation afterwards? I'm terribly sorry. Now I've got a forest of hands up, which I didn't have before. I, I'd like to wrap this up. Thank everybody. Thank you, thank you. Fergus. Thank the artists here. Team Mary Helen Young, Sophia Victoria, and Cassie. And just to pick up the threads that came through about the importance of artists led, n secular, non nation um, uh, focused festivals that started in 1947, I think we're kind of agreeing that they're even more important now. So uh, let's uh, drink to that, as it were. Yeah. Please go back and, and enjoy the next one. Thank you very much.